Welcome to our next talk, everyone. The person who is speaking to us today is Jan Honig. He's one of the course instructors, and he's going to give us hopefully more of a background of how to think about data science and sort of in general how to approach the different talks that we've been talking about this semester. So without further ado, Jan, take it away. Hello. <laughs> Thank you very much for having this chance to speak a little bit. I'm Jan Hanek. I'm one of the people here who who's put this class together. And it's it has been so much fun. So just want to remind you that if you need to reach me, I have my office hours Monday and Wednesday, 2 to 3 p.m. And the link is on the syllabus. I didn't want to put the link here at the open stuff. But you know, you can call my, you can email me, you can tweet at me, but I don't really check Twitter, so I wouldn't probably expect a response. I do not have TikTok or anything like that. Now, I thought it would be nice since we are, we are some of the people who have done this, who have prepared this class, maybe I'll tell you a little bit about myself so you know who I am and where I'm coming from, and then, then I'll talk about three interesting and basic things. So first I'm from the Czech Republic, which is a country in the center of Europe. I grew up in a city of Prague. I hope some of you had been there. It's a wonderful place. It's really beautiful. And I actually grew up in a house right somewhere where my mouse is pointing right under the castle. That was a great place to grow up, kind of, if you minus some other things. But that's where I'm from. Uh, my PhD, I went in Prague, I went to get my master's in mathematics. I got my PhD from Michigan State. And then I worked for a couple of years at Colorado State and then for like 12 years here at UNC. A little bit more about myself. I'm married to Shivan Nupert, who is a professor at NC State. We have two kids, Clara and Declan. What's kind of funny is when they were little kids, they looked exactly alike. I always looking at this, have a hard time remembering which one's which, but I think Clara's on the left and Declan on the right. On a personal note, you would find me mountain biking, I play cello, I like going to church, and of course, I really love research and teaching, so it's really fun to be sharing with you some basic ideas about some of the basic statistics and mathematics underpinning some of these complex talks you'll be hearing. And my research is mainly on things related to theoretical statistics, something called generalized fiducial statistics and also some biological applications. We have, we have one project that's using COVID data that's kind of fun. It has to do with looking at how, how the virus changes while it is inside a person rather than like changing around the world. Anyway, so that's about me. Now, what, what am I going to talk about? Really, I'm planning to talk about three things. So this shouldn't be an extremely long talk, but I thought it would be really important to like mention these things and actually think about some of the stuff that we hear on the news and why is it important. So first will be Bayes theorem and diagnostic tests. You know, we hear a lot about COVID tests. Maybe some of you took a COVID test and it will be good to think about a little bit what, that, what do the various results mean when people talk about sensitivity and specificity, what do they mean? And how good really COVID tests are or are not. Then people have talked a lot about various drugs that have been used for COVID. 
and vaccines. And so I want to mention a little bit about what's a randomized control trial and why is it important? And what does it mean when you say that vaccine is 50 or 80 or 70% effective? Because it turns out it's not completely clear what these things mean. So at least when you hear it on the news, you'll know and understand. So let's do the base theorem. And I see if I can do some markups. So if you, if you look at this, Bayes' theorem is a way to invert probability. So if you look at this picture, you could think that this black thing is being having a disease, while the blue things would somehow maybe stand for getting a positive result. Oh, what is happening here? Oh no. So we're getting a positive result. So typically when people talk about the tests, what they will give you is something called sensitivity and specificity. So what is sensitivity? Sensitivity is a value that it tells you if you know, like if you look at the group of people who have this particular disease, who have this particular condition, how likely is it that for these people, the test will come positive? So, this is the sort of one of the really important things. Can we tell that the test is supposed to be like, if somebody is sick, will the test say they are sick? Now, specificity is like the converse to it. If somebody is not sick, if they don't have the condition, what's the chance that the test will come out negative? Of course, you would kind of want both of these to be very high, right? Because if you are sick or if you have the condition, you, you would want the test to come out positive almost all the time. And similarly, if you do not have the condition, you would want the test to be negative almost most of the time. And so, you know, Many of us have seen something like a pregnancy test. You know, you go to a drugstore, you buy, you, you, you can buy it, and it'll test for a presence for a particular hormone associated with pregnancy. And if you wait long enough, these tests are actually very good. So you can have sensitivity of like 95 to 98 percent, and specificity also very, very high provided you waited the right amount of time. So you know, this is the test that most people think of. It turns out that the COVID test is not as good as the pregnancy test. The COVID test has a sensitivity of somewhere between 70 and 90%. So this is that you should actually really, really think about this is not as great as you think, namely, among the people, if the 70% is true, and we'll talk about why in a moment, but among the people who take the test, among the ones who are sick, maybe somewhere between 10 to 30% actually get a negative test thinking they are okay, but they actually still have the condition, which is not perfect. It turns out the specificity for this RNA COVID test is very, very good. And we'll explain why that is. So it turns out that if you get a positive result on the test, that's usually a very, very good indication that you have a problem. But if you get a negative result, that doesn't mean that you do not have a problem. It just means it's much less likely now to have a problem. And now that's, this is where the, where the base theorem comes through. So how am I going to use the result of the positive or negative test? So it starts with your 
with this probability a priori before you take any tests that you have the condition that's this ps that's the probability of this red piece that probability sometimes it calls the prior probability namely prior, what do you think or believe or something like that prior to taking any test now this prior probability could be pretty high high for example if you have all the symptoms then you probably your prior probability could be definitely 50 percent or more that you actually have the disease now if you have none of the symptoms and you just uh, you just uh, was in a Zoom meeting with somebody who had a COVID, and you are now worried that COVID jumped through the through the through the internet. I'm joking, of course. Then you know your prior probability can be pretty low. So it kind of depends on the situation. Similarly, if a woman is taking a pregnancy test, that usually means that she believes there's a pretty good chance she could be pregnant. And that's also is why this pregnancy test is so good. Nobody's just cold piece on a steak that does not happen. However, with other things like random drug tests, people are just cold picked up. And then your, your prior probability might be very, very small. And that would then lead to potentially, even with a very good, with a very good test, some po false positive. So you have you have the prior probability. Now imagine that. So let's say it's fifty-fifty or some some sort of a thing. But what we are really interested in is this posterior probability over here. So the prior probability is over here, and I guess here and there. And the posterior probability is over there. What is the posterior probability? The posterior probability is the probability that you have the condition given that you got the positive test. Really, that is the thing you want to know, right? And it is not the 95%, it is not the 98%, it is not the 70%, it is whatever comes out of this formula. In other words, you have to weigh the chance that you get the positive, really the bottom of, the, of this formula. The bottom here is kind of explaining what's going on. Oh. Sorry, I don't know what happened. Clear all my drawings, go back. So the bottom of this formula, what is going on with this? Oh, the bottom of this formula really explains what is going on, right? You can get a positive result either as a correct positive if I am sick, or something called false positive if I am not sick. The false positivity rate is really one minus the specificity rate. And really whatever happens with your positive test depends on the, on the relative proportions of how many people you get getting the right positive test and how many people you get the false positive test. And there, in addition to the sensitivity and specificity, it really also matters whether, how many people actually have to, what is the prior probability of having it, the condition. You know, in some ways, it's much easier to understand the Bayes theorem if I look at, instead of probabilities, at odds. So this is the same formula as before, but reformulating in terms of reformulated in terms of odds. So the thing over here, and let me maybe see if I can still draw. This thing over here is called the prior odds. 
and well, sorry, the posterior arts, and this is exactly what you want. So it's the posterior arts. That's what I want to know. What what are the odds of me having the disease? So you know, if it's thousand, then you are thousand to one having the disease. If it's 0.001, that's 100 to one that you don't have the disease. So in some ways, odds are a very natural way how people understand probability. You know, if you, often people, when you look at lotteries, it's another small passion of mine to understand lotteries, people explain them not in terms of probabilities, but in terms of odds. Now, what, uh, how do you compute this? There's really two pieces here. Huh. I lost my cursor. Here it is. Oh, this is crazy. I think this annotation really doesn't work. Oh, I lost my, anyway, so I lost my cursor. I don't think this is as great as I thought. So if I look at two things, I, how do I compute these posterior odds? This is the thing I want. Well, I start with the prior odds, which are the odds of, of me having the condition before taking any tests. If the prior odds are very small, the posterior odds will probably will still be very small. And then there is this piece in the middle that, that is called base factor. And I don't know what's happening. See if this helps. No. I need to delete this markup. Sorry, I'm I got too cute and I lost my cursor. Here's my cursor. But I am missing it on this side. Sorry, I might have to come back to this. This is What's happening to my mouse? Why is it not? Ah. Okay, good. Sorry about this. This is really annoying. So what is the really important part is this base factor. The base factor tells me whether, uh, how much the data change my prior odds. So for example, for the pregnancy test, if you get a positive test, you will multiply your prior odds by 47 and a half. That's a lot. So it really, really, you know, even if, if you had 50-50, that you are pregnant, then you have almost 50 to one, very overwhelming uh, results. And if you get a negative test, it's, you multiply things by 0 0.05, which is 20 to one. So again, if you had 50, 50, now it's 20 to one in the direction of not being pregnant. On the other hand, the COVID test, if you get a positive test, it multiplies the prior odds by 14. Usually, people don't just cold take the test. So the probability of having it a priori is probably not too small to begin with, maybe one to 10 or something or one to one. And then you get a COVID test that has 14 times base factor and it really increases the odds quite a bit. If you get a negative result, then the base factor is relatively small, about one third. So it only lowers your prior odd by about a factor of three. And that's not as much as you would want to. So the picture on this right hand side kind of explains what's going on. It, it comes from, I took it from the paper I had you read. So here at the top, the black stuff over here, this shows the prior odd. So you have 
100 people, maybe 80 have COVID and 20 do not have COVID. So your prior odds are actually, uh, what is it? Two to one, no, three, four to one in direction of having COVID. So I, it's very likely if you just picked a random person, you would get a chance of 0.8, or as I said, the prior odds are 80 over 20, so four to one. Now, you, they are tested for COVID. So there's these 100 people, they got tested for COVID. And I don't know if you can see the shades, but 57, the top 57, have positive results and the bottom 43 have negative results. Now remember the truth is this black thing on top that we don't know, we just want to kind of understand it. The thing we do know is this, is this blue stuff in the middle, who got what? And now down here is what happens actually. So, on the top, the blue people are the people who were sick and tested positive. So those are really like the correct decision people. On the bottom here are the people who were not sick and got a negative result. Great. The problematic people are here in the middle. So this one red person was actually a false positive. So there was one person who was not sick but got a positive result. Well, that's bad to them. They'll be, they'll be locked somewhere for two weeks and eventually they'll emerge without any long lasting problems. The real issues are the, the, or the yellow people over here who get a negative COVID test that's called false negative because they are actually sick. And that is worrying, right? So, you know, the reason why this person was, uh, it was like, I wish that the red was over here, right? Because uh, that, would, that would match. This person was supposed to move here. I don't know why they ordered it this way. But as you can see, in other words, the, the base theorem tells you how many false positive and how many false negative you would expect. And that's what happens. So I hope I'm not scaring you too much. Now you can ask, why does the, why do we have such a low sensitivity, right? Like we would hope that things would work really well. Well, it even, if you ask a biologist, they'll say RNA detection tests are actually very good. If you get enough RNA in there, you are almost certain to detect it. And remember, how do the typical RNA tests that you can see on TV or some of them, some of you might have even taken it, you know, they take a swab, they swap deep, deep in your nose, then they clip it off, put it in a vial, send it off somewhere. What they are looking for is a little, is are pieces of the virus DNA, or actually RNA, it's not a virus, but virus RNA. And if it's there, they'll see it. So the RNA direction is, the detection is very too good. So really the question why maybe we have a low sensitivity is, is there enough of the virus in the sample? And there is several, there's like, I know of three and there's probably more things that affect this. The first of them is time since infection. So if you get, if you get in, if you get affected, infected for the first few days, you will not be able to detect the virus. The, the viral load in your body is too small. Then, about two days after your, you get symptoms, the viral load peaks, and that's when you get a, actually a very, uh, your sensitivity will be much higher than the 70%. Mm -hmm. 
Now, the second thing is, is the sample collected properly? Was it swapped far enough into your nose? Was it was, or the spit was done the right way? Again, the different tests have different sensitivity based on how likely it is that you can collect a good sample. And there is another kind of strange thing that has to do with the, the fact that this is an RNA and not a DNA test. So RNA is used in living things to produce proteins. And in reaction to the environment, some RNA pieces of, the, uh, of RNA is upregulated, which means there is more of it. And some portions of the, of the RNA sequence will be downregulated. There is less of it, depending on whether you need more or less of that, of that protein that this piece of RNA codes for. So you can have the same two people, the same length of sickness, maybe even infected by the same person. But for some reason in one person, the part of the RNA that the test is targeting is upregulated and then the other person it's downregulated. And of course you are much more likely to get a positive result for the upregulated person. So that's, that's about tests. The second thing is, you know, if you listen to, to the news, people talk about vaccines and all sorts of stuff. And the two words that people say safe and effective are heard over and over again. So, you know, there is a lot of, there was a lot of talk about this compound that I have on the right, the hydroxychloroquine. Let me quickly summarize. In March 2020, a French professor based on a 40 patient sample claimed that it helps with COVID-19. In May 2020, some reports showed some side effects. In June 2020, a very careful randomized control trial showed no effect or side effects. So neither effects or side effects. And you know, there's more. There, is, there are more studies that are gonna come out. I think there was one more randomized control trial. So right now, people, uh, the, the scientific consensus is that hydroxychloroquine is not dangerous, but it's, all, well, other than it has side effects that are known, but not unusually dangerous, but it's also not helpful. You know, you could take uh, I don't know, something else, like sugar pill will also help you about the same. So that seems to be the scientific consensus. And like, where does all this confusion come from? So when you are making decisions about drugs, what you are trying to really show is that this particular chemical compound is causing some reaction, some biological effect. That's actually a very difficult thing to prove that something is causing something else is very difficult statistically. There are multiple issues, right? So in the original French study, there was no control group. So there's not really control against not getting tests. It was really more observational. Some people happened to have it, some people didn't. And then you have something called lurking variables. You know, you can see for example, you know, if you wanted to show that drug is really having good effects and you wanted to cheat, well, what will you do? You don't give the drug to old people and you give the drug to young people and then you can claim, look, I have very few deaths in my drug group. Well, of course, because they are young people and they have very few deaths to begin with. But uh, it's more subtle, right? Because there could be causes that we do not know. So one has to be very careful if you are claiming that some compound is causing a biological effect that you do not, that you do not somehow get something else causing it. 
in statistics class, if you take a basic statistics class, there's a, cl there's a classic kind of overused example that if you look at the number of shard attacks and the number of ice cream sold on the beach, they are heavily, highly correlated. You get a lot more shark attacks when more ice cream is sold on the beach. And you, if, you, if you were naive, you can think, oh no, what is it with the ice cream? Maybe people who ate ice cream are tastier or something? Of course not, right? It's, if there is, the, the lurking variable is the number of people on the beach. If there are more people on the beach, they are more likely to be eaten by sharks and they are more likely to eat ice cream. So that's what we are trying to point out that the fact that, so, that there's a more of something in one group and less in another group does not mean that the way you created the groups is causing this effect. Another big deal is something called placebo effects, which I don't understand. But it turns out apparently that if you believe that you are getting an effective treatment, you are more likely to have your body respond to it as it's working, even if, the, even if that is not causing anything. It's pretty amazing. So that's why in, in control trials that you'll be talking about, the controls are usually given something called placebo just to make sure that they think they got something, of course, with, with permission. They know that they can get placebo. But... And then there is an experimenter bias. You know, if you really want for the drug to succeed, you might even subconsciously decide as an experimenter to give the drug to people who either need it more or to the people who are more likely to respond. And that could really create a bias in, in how the results come out. So the gold standard solution that is being, for example, now used to evaluate the COVID vaccines and any other COVID drug is called randomized control trial. So what is randomized control trial? So you have to have a control and treatment group. So you cannot just give the drug to everybody and say, hey, they got better. That's, you have to compare it to something else. Now, depending on what state of nature you are at, the controls are different. So for example, if you want to show, you already know there is an effective drug to, to treating this particular disease. You are not going to be controlled, controlling by placebo, that, that would be unethical. What you would do in that case, you, have the, the, you would have half people or a proportion of people get the new drug and maybe controlled by the old drug because that way, people are getting at least something. So maybe you have a belief that the new drug is much better, but the old drug kind of works. So then you would control, in the control group, you would, you would, uh, in the control group, you would control with a uh, old drug. Now in a COVID situation, we do not really have any really good a really good proven vaccine. We don't really have really good proven uh, treatments. There are some treatments that seem to work a little bit, but you know, let's say in March we had nothing. So then you control by, by placebo. So placebo in a vaccine trial can be a vaccine for some completely unrelated thing like measles, right? So because the, because of the placebo effect, you need to have the people believe they got the real thing. You know, they sign up, they know that half of them will get treatment, half of them will get the placebo. That's the 
deal that if you sign up for a uh, to be a subject in a randomized control trial, you are told this. And it's double blind, which means nobody knows. The experimenter doesn't know whether it's placebo. The doctor injecting you doesn't know whether it's placebo. Nobody knows it until the until it's time to to analyze the data because you do not want to bias the result. And so, you know, the placebo could be a meningitis or or measles vaccine, so that when you get the shot, you get some reaction. Like you know, people say, "I got the shot." That was on TV. I remember. I got the shot. And I felt a little bit of chills the evening, so I know I got the right vaccine. Well, that's the whole point. You want everybody to believe they got the right vaccine, even though they know they might have gotten placebo. So you got the people in your trial, you split them randomly. You potentially could do, and you know, there's many flavors of randomized control trials depending on how you're splitting. It's important it's randomly because random selection might counteraffect a lot of lurking variables that you don't even know about. But sometimes there are some effects that you want to control for, like sometimes people of different ages might have a different reaction, people of different races might have a different reaction to a particular vaccine. So in that case, then you first divide people in their in the groups that you want to have equally represented and then within them to select randomly. But it's really important that the final selection, even after stratifying to different subgroups, is done randomly and not on the experimenter's whim. This is really important. Uh, one of the pioneers of, of modern statistics, R.A. Fisher, in the 20s really pushed this and it's really truly super important that the selection is at random and then so you know the picture here is you have the people who signed up they are split randomly into two groups some of them get the placebo some of them get the actual drug and then you look at reaction you know how many people got sick or how many people in this this i took from some from the internet it was some like it was an economic stuff so getting green was a good thing so maybe you can say the green people the, the green people uh, let's say got sick and therefore i can see that in this top group there's a lot more people who got sick than in the bottom group. And then you compare the outcomes. So that's randomized control trial. And it's extremely important that really any decisions on whether a vaccine should be used or a drug should be used is based on, on preferably several of these. So in the US, one of the ways they decide whether drug can be used or vaccine can be used is through something called clinical trials. It's an entire people study it. If you get a PhD in biostat, you can spend your entire life making very good living at pharmaceutical companies running these, these, uh, these uh, clinical trials. There's four phases in the first one. They just check that it does something in the second phase there are few not very many people and they don't at that moment care whether it works they want they are making sure that you are not getting really sick from it and then you have the phase three this is what what several of the vaccines are in right now it's very large tens of thousands of people preferably in multiple places in the on, on earth and they are proving that it's effective, namely that you get the right response in your control group, in your treatment group more often than in your control group. So in vaccine case, you want to get less people in your treatment group to get sick than in your control group. And there's a lot of statistical analysis, right? Because I sort of explained the vanilla flavored randomized control trial, but the real stuff is a lot more complicated because 
you need to, as I said, control for things you know, like that should depend. It's also tricky with vaccines that you want to make sure that you actually do the trial on people who have a chance of getting a vaccine. So I have a friend who works on HIV vaccine. HIV is super hard. It's super hard. It's not clear whether you could have a vaccine. And they are doing trials in, in places like, I think, South Africa among, among prostitutes, I think. So some places where you know that there is a chance people actually get it. The same thing with COVID, right? The COVID vaccines need to be done on people who actually leave their house. If you never leave your house and have your food delivered, then you probably will not be selected for this because I, you won't get the disease, yay. But you will not really tell people whether the vaccine works or not. So it's really cool. And I would recommend if you think this is cool, study statistics. So my last, my last thing I want to talk about is you hear it on the, on the news, vaccine efficacy. I don't know if you heard somebody said that in the US, the vaccine will only be approved if, it's, if it's, it can be shown to be 50% effective. Well, what does it mean? It turns out, there is a lot of different measures of efficacy. So I, a friend of mine, the, the, the person who works on the HIV vaccine, when I told him about me talking about this subject, he sent me this PDF for a book that looked like it has thousand pages. So I went to the you know, introductory sections and found how many? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight basic definitions of vaccine efficacy. So, you know, if you got a little confused reading the, the, the reading material I assigned, don't be surprised. There's truly many different versions. So the first one here, the VES is the one typically people talk about. It's the efficacy for susceptibility, namely how good the vaccine is in for just normal person who is susceptible for it to not to how how many of susceptible people are protected but even that so that's what they usually talk about when you hear vaccine efficacy but even that's complicated because there we'll see on the next page there's like 25 different formulas how this can be written and, or computed but there are other options. So VECOL is vaccine efficacy for colonization, which you could understand as a, as a symptomatic disease. In other words, is how many people are protected against even getting the asymptomatic case of the disease. That one's trickier to find, but you, know, you could understand that for COVID, this would be a very important measure. If you could completely knock out asymptomatic cases, that would change the stuff very much, but usually that's not what happened. VEP is actually uh, how well does the vaccine protect you if you got the disease? I know many of you probably take the flu shot. Please make sure you get a flu shot this year. Public service announcement. I'm gonna get mine on Thursday. But we have all had the case, you get the flu shot and then you get the flu anyway. It happened to me two years. I've been getting flu shot for many years, but I think two times during the time I got the flu. And the expectation, and I think in my case it is what it was, is that even though you get the flu, you will get a milder case. So in that case, the vaccine did not protect you, so it was not efficacious for susceptibility, but it was efficacious for progression or pathogenicity of the disease. Uh, 
Another one is how likely is it for people who got who eventually get the disease to be infectious? So again, you know, you, you can have a failure of preventing the disease, but maybe you get such a mild case that you will not affect anybody. And from epidemiological point of view, that's really important too. And so there is this total vaccine efficacy. It just like it combines all of these effects together and it sort of measures the effect of the vaccine on the entire process, right? You know, some people get sick, but they don't have a bad disease, so they don't infect other people. So overall in the population, the cases decrease. And in some ways, the randomized controlled trials might be measuring that rather than some, something else. And especially once you get, even though, you know, the trials are probably not big enough, so they'll measure the VS. But once you once you vaccinate a lot of people, you might get other good effects that will suppress the disease. So your VET will be higher, better than VES. You know, in the reading material, there was a there was an example where the where you got the VES something but if you applied it you realize that you get actually better overall efficacy in the population than what it is on paper and you know and you know there are other things like herd immunity and so the ve3 is sort of everything put together now also you should know that there is a difference between efficacy, which is in controlled trials, and effectiveness, which is in the wild. When things are not controlled, you might get some other effects. You know, if, again, if you if you vaccinate 60, 70 percent of your population, you will have some effects that you will not see in the lab. I don't really want you to read it. I just want to show you there are like hundreds different formulas how you can compute all these different efficacies. The main I want to the main thing I want us to say is sort of on the high level. If CDC says that the vaccine needs to be at least fifty percent affected, what they are really saying roughly is that if you take the number of people who get sick divided by the number who were vaccinated divided by the number of vaccinated people. So I want to look at the proportion of the sick people in the vaccinated group divided by the proportion of the sick people in the placebo group. So if it's 50% effective, what this is saying is that the proport, let's say I get 20% in the placebo group, so 50% effective vaccine would have 10% in the vaccinated group, half as many. So, you know, if I, if, if there are only, you know, I have 30,000 people, so let's say, may, let's make it simple, 10,000 in placebo group, 10,000 in the, in the treatment group. If I get 500 people who get the disease, it's a little low, but let's say 500 people get the disease in the placebo group, then in order for the vaccine to be 50% affected, I should be getting about 250 people in the vaccinated group, half as many. And you know, if I had 10,000 in placebo and 20,000 in treatment, then you would because there is the denominator is twice as big, you would get 50% effectiveness if the number of sick people in both groups were about the same. Now, this, this is very different than what normal people think. If you think 50% effectiveness, you would think that's 50% chance that I don't get sick. And that is not quite what it means. It really means a reduction. Now, the scary thing is that this VES can be negative. There are some diseases where having some immunity could actually make things worse. Dengue fever and HIV are an example where potentially having some immunity is worse than having no immunity at all. 
So one has to be very careful because sometimes a vaccine can make things worse. Now you would think that at worst it'll not do anything, but that's not the case. And this is my last slide. There is another way how you can think about effectiveness of vaccine within this SIR model. So SIR model is you have the susceptible people with some rate, they get infected. And the rate typically is modeled as proportional to how many susceptible and effective pe infected people you have. The more infected, the more chance of getting infected. And uh, if I have a bigger pool, there's also a bigger chance of somebody getting sick. Then people get better. Now recovered is doesn't necessarily mean that they got healthy. It can also mean that they died because recovered just means they can't infect people anymore. So recovered people are not people who are just like got better. It's people who got, who are right now not being able to get infected. And you know, eventually your immunity wane and you go back to susceptible. If you have vaccination, then you have a new group of people. So from susceptible, you get moved to vaccinated with some rate. And, but again, like before your protection wanes, so you go back to susceptible, but also for some people it just didn't work. And even though they have vaccinated, they still get the disease, but preferably at some lower rate. So it's the old rate times something. And again, this, depending on what you look at, your vaccine efficacy could be this tau over here, which is the reduction of the rate from which you move from the vaccinated to susceptible. So 50% would mean 50% effectiveness would be tau is 50%, so half the rate. 90% effective would mean tau is 0.9, so one tenth, 90% reduction in the rate. But that's conditional. You can also say, well, what's the chance overall I get the vaccine, but overall I get sick? Well, that's higher. The effectiveness is lower because you might also just move back to susceptible and then get sick. So there are different, again, there are different versions of efficacy. And I think that concludes my talk. Okay, thank you, Jan. Everyone, if you could put your emoji hands together <laughs> and thank our speaker, I'm sure you would appreciate it. So we are currently over our time period. So if you need to head out, absolutely. Um, I will post this recording. If anyone wants to stick around, I'm sure Jan could take a question or two if you're interested, but optional. Also, group nine um, put together a list of questions, which I think I'm just going to share with Jan. And if he has time, he'll answer some of them, and I'll post those on the Sakai site for additional information. But thank you very much. And if anyone wants to stick around and ask a question or two, we can stay on for a couple more minutes, but we do kind of have to wrap things up. Yeah, feel free to ask a question. I forgot that we are over time. I thought we have an hour. Um, Jan, I think we have one in the chat. Would you mind explaining how having some immunity can be worse than having none at all for some cases? So that's not about COVID. This was about dengue fever and potentially HIV. It turns out that if you have a virus that attacks your immune system, like dengue, then if you have no immunity, you get the regular progression of the disease. And with dengue, what happens is that there are four strains of dengue and you'll have for a year or two immunity against every kind. But after that time, you will only keep immunity against that one strain of dengue, but not the other three. And this is what, what happens when you get infected by the new strain of dengue later. Then you get a small immune response, but not big enough to kill the virus. 
And because the virus is actually using the immune cells to spread itself, it's like the immune response actually accelerates the spread of the disease throughout the body, you know. The, the immune cells get close to the virus, but it's not enough of them to kill the virus. So the virus infects them instead and then spreads out. And that's called, I think, uh, immunity at enhanced disease. So, so in this, and I think HIV could work a little bit like that because it's also your, an immunity, a virus that attacks the immune system. So if, again, if you get a response, but not strong enough to kill the virus, the virus then uses the immune response to spread itself faster. Let's hope COVID isn't like that. <laughs> I don't think it is, but let's hope. Hi, uh, can I ask a quick question? Sure. Thank you so much for, first of all, thank you for, so much for this presentation. I'm getting ready for this presentation. I found several uh, online calculators that uh, calculate sensitivity of the test. And my question, how is it um, possible to, like this calculator, online calculator, to give us exact result? So I believe, I don't know what calculator you speak about, but I suspect these calculators do the base theorem. Mm -mm. So they don't actually calculate the sensitivity and specificity of the test. I think those are inputs into it. But it says, you know, if you have a, it's, it'll be calculating the base theorem, right? Taking your prior art and multiplying it by the, by the base factor and getting you the posterior odds or you know, probabilities. That it can be easily automated. But getting sensitivity and specificity is the lab work. They have to, in the lab, actually calculate things. And it's tricky. It's not easy because, you know, who has it, who doesn't. Alexandra, did the calculators you looked at, did they have like data inputs or did you input yeah, something? Yeah, yeah, like you know, I look at the calculator and I can send and uh, there, uh, there is data input and estimated value, confidence interval, and like this clinical calculator. And I found several of them. Yeah, that like can predict. And for me, it's like, it's a question, how is it possible to give it an exact result? So. Well, so again, the, you have to have the data has to be in the, done in the lab. Once you have the data, you'll use statistical methods to compute your estimate of the, of the sensitivity and specificity. So it's another thing that this could be computing, right? You enter stuff that you get from actual lab work and it gives you a confidence interval on the specificity or the base factor. I actually find the base factor a nice way to think about base, base theorem. The, you know, rather than having this long formula, it's a product. Thank you. Okay, Jan, I think we'll wrap it up, but would you be willing to answer some of the questions that my group came up with? Sure. I can show you. Do you want me to do it here in person or? Um, <laughs> it's, so it's, it's a longer list and some of them you might have already answered. So if you could just take a scan and if there's anything you know and you didn't answer, like okay. write the answer. So, so yes, you want me to you will like email it to me and you want me to respond by email? Yeah, and then I'll just, I'll post it on the Sakai page. Okay, that know. sounds fine. Okay. Uh, well, thank you, everyone. And thank you, Jan, okay. especially. Yeah, bye-bye.